Hai, saya Nur Munira Azman. Saya merupakan koordinator projek Shorebirds Peninsula Malaysia. Tahukah anda, Pulau Pinang bukan sahaja syurga makanan dan tempat tarikan pelancong, ia juga adalah tempat persinggahan yang penting bagi burung pantai hijrah. Jom kita pergi ke kawasan Paya Bakau dan dataran lumpur Teluk Air Tawar Kuala Muda. Teluk Air Tawar Kuala Muda terletak di pesisir pantai utara tanah besar Pulau Pinang. Keluasan hutan Paya Bakau ini adalah sekitar 600 hektar dan merupakan satu-satunya hutan Paya Bakau yang masih tidak terganggu di Pulau Pinang. Ikuti kami untuk mengenali burung pantai hijrah di Pulau Pinang. Spesies burung air hijrah ini berhijrah ke selatan semasa musim sejuk. Pada masa ini, musim pembiakan sudah berakhir dan kita boleh melihat perubahan pada bulu mereka yang bertukar daripada bulu mengawan iaitu breeding plumage kepada bulu tidak mengawan iaitu non-breeding plumage. Menjelang musim panas, burung-burung ini akan berhijrah pulang ke utara. Ketika inilah, kita dapat melihat mereka berada dalam fasa warna bulu mengawan yang lebih menarik berbanding semasa fasa tidak mengawan. Mari kita lihat 5 spesies burung pantai hijrah yang biasa dijumpai di pesisir pantai Teluk Air Tawar Kuala Muda. Ini ialah Common Red Shank atau Kedidi Kaki Merah. Burung ini berasal dan membiak di utara benua Eurasia. Biasanya, burung ini boleh dilihat dalam kumpulan ketika mencari makanan. Diet utamanya ialah umpun-umpun. Jika ada ancaman daripada pemangsa atau manusia, common red shank akan mengeluarkan bunyi amaran kepada burung-burung lain dan akan terus terbang meninggalkan tempat tersebut. Tetapi, jangan terkeliru dengan common green shank. Common green shank kakinya tidak berwarna merah seperti common red shank. Seterusnya, kita ada lesser sand plover atau rapang Mongolia. Burung ini membiak di kawasan tengah dan timur laut benua Asia. Lesser sand plover merupakan burung pantai yang bersaiz kecil. Ia menggunakan matanya yang besar untuk mencari makanan di tataran lumpur. Biasanya, ia akan memerhati dan menunggu makanan kegemarannya iaitu umpun-umpun dan pada masa yang tepat, ia akan menyambar mangsanya. Spesies yang hampir sama dengan lesser sand plover ialah Greater Sand Plover. Anda boleh membezakan kedua-duanya dengan memerhatikan apa yang mereka makan. Greater Sand Plover suka makan ketam. Spesies ketiga dalam senarai ini ialah Wimbra atau Kedidi Pisau Raun. Wimbra membiak di pelbagai tempat di kawasan Hall Arctic iaitu kawasan utara benua Eurasia dan benua utara Amerika. Wimbrel adalah burung pantai yang sederhana besar dan mempunyai paruh yang melengkung ke bawah. Paruhnya adalah kira-kira tiga kali lebih panjang daripada kepalanya. Paruhnya yang sensitif dapat mengesan mangsa seperti ketam dan cacing di dalam lumpur. Spesies ini seakan-akan sama dengan Eurasian Keliu. Tetapi Eurasian Keliu adalah lebih besar dan paruhnya adalah empat kali lebih panjang daripada kepalanya. Seterusnya ialah Terex and Piper atau Kedidi Sering. Spesies ini membiak di kawasan utara benua Eurasia. Anda boleh mengenalnya dengan mudah dengan melihat paruhnya yang sedikit melengkung ke atas dan warna kuning pada dasar paruhnya. Terex and Piper adalah burung pantai yang sederhana kecil. Ia suka mengejar makanannya iaitu ketam. Biasanya ia lebih suka mencari makanan secara bersendirian dan bukannya berkumpulan. Burung yang kelima, iaitu yang terakhir yang saya ingin kongsikan, ialah Common Sandpiper atau Kedidi Pasir. Seperti Terex Sandpiper, Common Sandpiper juga membiak di kawasan utara benua Eurasia. Anda boleh jumpa burung-burung ini di sepanjang tebing sungai ketika air surut dan di kawasan pinggir pantai. Common Sandpiper ini paling mudah dikenali dengan memerhatikan hujung ekornya yang sering bergerak ke atas dan ke bawah, terutamanya ketika ia berdiri pegun. Spesies ini jarang dilihat dalam kumpulan dan lebih gemar bersendirian ketika mencari makanan. Diet utamanya ialah cacing dan invertebrata lain yang kecil. 
Burung-burung pantai hijrah kini adalah terancam kerana banyak habitat mereka telah pun dimusnahkan. Sudah tiba masanya untuk kita mengenali burung-burung pantai hijrah ini supaya kita dapat melindungi mereka dengan lebih baik. Jadi, anda sudah pun boleh membezakan lima burung pantai yang biasa ditemui di Teluk Aitawa, Kuala Muda. Adakah anda teruja untuk melihat burung-burung pantai hijrah ini di luar sana? Jika anda suka video ini, tekan butang like, kongsi dan ikuti saluran YouTube kami. Nantikan video seterusnya daripada kami tentang lima spesies burung pantai yang terancam di Teluk Aitawa, Kuala Muda. Jumpa anda nanti. Okay, Assalamualaikum and good evening everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Shawbirds webinar. Wherever you are in this world, wishing you stay safe from COVID-19. I am Nur Munira Azman, coordinator of Shawbirds Peninsula Malaysia project and your moderator tonight. Okay, in conjunction with World Migratory Bird Day 2021, which celebrated on the first week of May and October every year all over the world, SPMP once again is sharing with you a very hot topic tonight, which is the introduction of plumage and mop in shorebirds. We are going to dive deep into this topic with our special guest, which I believe everyone is super excited to hear his talk tonight. Okay, um, please, Tell us, let us know uh, who are you uh, yeah, um, uh, listening to us and where you watching from. So before I bring in our speaker tonight, I would like to introduce, um, yeah, uh, sharing a little bit about SPMP. So maybe some of you here might not familiar with a Shawbirds Peninsula Malaysia project, or maybe this is the first time you heard about about, about our project. So SPMP was established uh, in 2017 and the main of objective of this project is uh, to do monitoring of shorebirds in Teluk Aitawa, Kuala Muda, which everyone know Teluk Aitawa, Kuala Muda is the uh, one of the important bird and biodiversity area in Malaysia. It has become a, one of the important stopover for shorebirds. Yeah? So, Secondly, we are responsible to share knowledge on shorebirds to the public, especially school kids and locals. So webinar is one of our activity that we created since everybody know uh, we are in the middle of uh, COVID-19 uh, started last year. So, you know, webinar is the, the best medium that we can do, although we are at home. Although now everyone know we are in the, in the transition, yeah? Uh, although in the transition of pandemic to endemic, so we uh, we all, we always think webinar is um, the best medium that we can share uh, our knowledge on shorebirds to the public. So if you still remember, in August two thousand twenty, we had a webinar in Bahasa Melayu, yeah, with the same speaker, Mr. Dave, and we talk about the introduction of shorebirds. So I'm assuming uh, all the uh, viewers tonight uh, has um, the. Uh, basic, yeah, basic information or basic knowledge knowledge on shorebirds. At, le at least you know um, uh, the characteristic, the general characteristic of shorebirds, where to find the shorebirds, yeah, um, and and uh, know how to differentiate shorebirds and forest bird, yeah. Okay, so before I forget, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items and the structure of our webinar session today. We broadcast this web webinar live on our Facebook. This webinar session is divided into three segments. Yeah? First, we will begin with Dave's presentation on plumage and mob. Then we will answer questions from viewers uh, and, 
and at any time during the webinar, you may submit your questions to the guest speaker. Just type your question in, uh, in the comment section. Please keep your question um, short and straightforward. Yeah? Although this, this session is in English, we are welcome you to type um, question in Bahasa because Mr. Dave sangat mahir berbahasa Melayu. Saya pun suka cakap Bahasa Melayu dengan dia. Suka dengar dia cakap bahasa Melayu. So, as time allows, we will address uh, we will address uh, as many questions as possible. And lastly, we will then wrap up uh, to this webinar session. This webinar is recorded and you will be able to access uh, this recording by our Facebook. And also, we will upload the recorded version to our YouTube, uh, YouTube channel uh, later. Yeah. Okay, without further ado, I would like to pass this mic to Dave. And okay, Dave, over to you. Please introduce yourself and uh, you can start your presentation. All right, thank you very much, Munira. And uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us. It's great to see friends from so many different places. I can see Singapore, Philippines, Thailand, Brunei, uh, Malaysia. We've got some, some from... Uh, schools as well so welcome everyone yeah. um, let me begin to share my screen with you here we go all right uh, hopefully you can see this so uh, as Munira mentioned this is the second uh, webinar that we've done um, first one was was last August and it was an introduction to shorebirds uh, so tonight we're going to be doing another introduction, but this time uh, to plumage and molt in shorebirds. So I am assuming that you have some basic knowledge of at least the common species of shorebirds, and we won't be really dealing with identification of individual species this evening. Um, mm -hmm. Another uh, another assumption, um, well, I, I recognize that tonight we're going to be uh, there's going to be a lot of new information, if, especially if you've not uh, studied uh, malt and plumage before. And you may not be able to catch it all first time round. But as Munira mentioned, uh, this talk will be available afterwards. And so hopefully you can go back and uh, look at it again. So let me begin by showing you where we hope to go this evening. Uh, we're going to divide into this talk into three groups too. First of all, we're going to look at some basic feather groups or tracts, as they're called. We won't be looking at all of the feather tracts, uh, but the ones which are useful for determining plumage and age. Secondly, we're going to be uh, looking at two processes that impact feather appearance. That's uh, feather wear and bleaching. And then the main part of the talk will be looking at the plumage and molt cycle of most shorebirds. Okay, let's make a start then. So everyone knows this bird, but my question is, what's wrong with this picture? And uh, I, I dare say there's many things wrong anatomically with this bird, but the one that I want to draw your attention to is that he doesn't have any feather tracts. His feathers are just kind of stuck on in apparently random order all over the body. And uh, very few birds actually have feathers uh, like that. I think penguins are, are probably the only uh, family that have no feather tracts. That is, they just have feathers all over the body. Most birds, including shorebirds, uh, the feathers grow in certain distinct groups, which are called feather tracts. And so that's what we're going to look at in this first part of the talk. Um, as I mentioned, we won't look at every single feather tract, but we will look at six feather tracts, uh, in particular, the ones on the wings and the ones between the wings on the back here of this flying bird, which uh, will help us to be able to navigate and know our way around the bird when we're trying to tell what age it is. So first of all, starting with the feathers at the base of the neck, uh, in English, we call it the mantle. Uh, I don't know what the, the terms are in Bahasa, I apologize. Um, one of the reasons we decided to do this in English was because there are so many technical terms. Uh, next to the mantle, sort of on either side, are the bits that, that the covers, the feathers that cover the, the, the join between the body and the wings. And those are known as the scapulas. Um, so if you think of those, those feathers as 
covering the joint between the wing and the body. Then moving out onto the wing itself, the front part of the wing, um, there's a large tract of feathers known as coverts. Uh, and it, easy to remember, they cover the bases of the uh, flight feathers. The, the flight feathers are on the, the back part of the wing. So those are the coverts. And then looking at the flight feathers, starting with the innermost, uh, the tertials, and there are three of those, and they're longer feathers. And then going to the outside of the wing, the primaries, there are normally 10 of them. And then lastly, the secondaries, and there are normally 10 or so of them as well. So those are the six groups of feathers that we're going to focus on this evening. Where do they appear on the bird when it's on the deck, when it's not flying? Well, it's fairly easy to track the position of the mantle. It's uh, still there at the base of the neck. The next group of feathers below the mantle are the scapulars, uh, group two there, and then the, the wing coverts. As you can see, they cover most of the wing when the wing is closed, so much so that you can't really see much of the flight feathers at all. They're covered over by the coverts. Uh, then the, the tertials, uh, that group of three feathers that stretch back uh, and cover the wingtip, in some cases completely. And then right at the end of the wing are the primaries. Now, normally the primaries are blackish in color or very dark brown. Um, so, and they, they're the ones, they're the, the longest part, the longest feathers on the wing. And then uh, often invisible completely on a closed wing, we can just see here one or two secondaries, um, but most of the time they may not be visible at all. Just one other thing, I'm, I'll just point out to you, and that's the tail, which is underneath the primaries. And often if the primaries are, are held lower, then they completely cover the tail. And so sometimes uh, people say, oh, it had a black tail, but what they're looking at are the primaries. And it's, it's actually quite difficult to see the tail on a perched shorebird. Well, how does it work in, on a real bird? Uh, I'll use the same colors to point out the different feather groups. So here we have in pink, the mantle again, and then the scapulars, as you can see, these are quite large feathers and in some plumages, very distinctively patterned. There are five rows of scapulars, two upper rows, which are rather difficult to make out. And then these larger three lower rows, one, two, and then a few, a few here, that's the third row. Uh, and that's a very important set of feathers to pay attention to. And then the coverts, this, this large patch of brown here. And then the tertials, as I mentioned, that normally there are, well, there are three tertials, the primaries here, the secondaries, and underneath there, the tail, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it can be difficult to see when the bird is perched. And then going back to the flying bird, uh, a real one this time, and there they all are again. So the mantle, the scapulars, the tertials just about visible at the end, peeking behind the scapulars here, the wing coverts, the primaries, and the secondaries. And so often you can see that the things like a wing bar is, is caused by a pale, a pale tips to the coverts in the middle of the wing here. So it's very helpful to have a basic understanding of the different feather groups, at least these six groups. So one more look at this. And then I'm going to give you a short quiz. So try to memorize the position of these six groups because it's quiz time. And uh, all right, here we go. Yeah, ready, so here's the first the one. Yeah. <laughs> what group of feathers is the one where the arrow is pointed to? Is it A, the tertials, B, the coverts, or C, the secondaries? I'll give you a a moment or so to um, just write down, if you can in the chat, just write down which one you think it is, A, B, or C. Okay, it, okay it's- Okay, we wait for everyone to, to type uh, the answer on the chat box, yeah, on the, on the comment box. Okay, so Linda Kagon, again, okay. Kagon, but uh, C, C, secondaries, Zongyi, C, Ashwin, secondaries, Jens, A, Afik, A, 
Okay. So, different answers there. <laughs> yeah, I can see a lot of answers yeah, coming Michael, in. C. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, of them, majority of them answer C. Yeah. Is it okay. correct? Well, let's move on to the next one first. Okay. Uh, what group of feathers is this? Is it A, the secondaries, B, the primaries, or C, the tertials? So this is question number two. So perhaps when you write your answer, you could write, Question two, and then the C. Otherwise, we won't know which which yes, your answer. Just, just put the alphabet. Yeah. Well, yeah. B, C. <laughs> so primaries or tertials this primaries. time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Afik. You just mentioned the number of the question. That makes it easier. All right, lots of primaries coming in. One second of secondaries. Some more tertials. I can see some people having more than one go. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, question two. Okay. All right, let's go on to the third question or the third picture. What is this group of feathers? Are they A, scapulars, B, mantle, or C, coverts? This is uh, easier, I think, compared to the other two questions. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. So write, write down three if you want to give the answer to the third question. People still answer. Some answer coverts. All right, now I can see some answers coming in for number three. Mm -hmm. All right, a good, a good, uh, I think the majority are going for A on this one. All right, so here's the, here's the answers. Uh, so look again at this little diagram down in the bottom right. For question one, uh, which one is it? Most of you put the secondaries, some put the tertials, very few put the coverts, but that's what they are. These, <laughs> are, these are the coverts, the back end of the coverts. So if you can imagine the, the coverts are kind of this group here, the tertials are these three feathers here and the secondaries, just this one feather here we can see. So if you put B, very well done. That was a tricky one, probably the hardest of all. All right, number two. I think a lot of people put primaries and tertials, not so many, a few put uh, secondaries. So the answer is, again, if you look on the little diagram, it should help. It is tertials. Remember that I said the primaries are mostly black. So here's the primaries, just visible underneath the tertials. There's the tail, the primaries, and then these long brown feathers here are tertials. So well done if you got C. And the third question, uh, a lot of people put A, uh, scapulars, and if you did, you are correct. So did anybody get all three correct? I could see a few people going, yay. <laughs> anyway, if you didn't, it, it doesn't matter because part of the purpose of today is to just give you the information. You can go back over it uh, again and again as many times as you like later. But well done if you got at least two right, and uh, extremely well done if you got all three right. Okay, we're going to move on to the next part of the talk now, which is looking at two processes which make a, a big difference to the appearance of feathers, and that is wear and bleaching. Okay, a few people congratulated themselves with a glass of champagne. I like that. So um, yeah, have a look at this, this photograph. It's a picture of the national flag of Malaysia, the Jalo Gumilang. But as you can see, it has seen better days. And the reason I put this photograph up is because it illustrates two processes that happen uh, both to flags and also to shorebird feathers. One of the things you notice is that the edge of the flag is extremely ragged and torn. And we call that process wear. It's a, it happens as parts of the feather are worn off by abrasion. Uh, that is friction with uh, the elements, the wind, sand, dust, 
water, rain, uh, just the combined effect of um, uh, friction between the feather or the flag and the elements eventually uh, wears away the edges of it. And the interesting thing is you notice that on this flag, the white parts are more worn away than the colored parts. And the reason for that is the pigment that gives color actually strengthens the cloth or the feather. And so where the, uh, where the feather has no pigment, where it's white, it wears away much faster than when it has color. And I'll show you that in a moment. The other thing that we can see on this flag is the effect of sunlight, and that's known as bleaching. And as uh, sunlight uh, impacts the colors of this flag, it becomes paler and duller, and the colors begin to lose their contrast with each other. And both of these um, are seen on the feathers of shorebirds. Let me show you uh, an example. This is a drawing of a redneck stint juvenile scapula feather. And you'll notice that when it's in fresh condition, it has this lovely white tip and sort of pale chestnut edges. But as it wears away, it becomes overall darker, that the, um, the black sort of diamond becomes initially darker and then it, the whole feather just loses its definition. And you get this spike at the end where the feather shaft uh, protrudes because that's the strongest part of the feather. So this is what happens as the bird, uh, as the feathers get older. And we can see that on a couple of live birds. So here's a nice fresh juvenile scapula on a redneck stint with the white tip. And then just about three weeks later, here's another one, the same plumage, but this time the wear, uh, because of feather wear, the whites have gone, the chestnuts have gone. And overall, you're left with a bird that is much darker and duller. And it may even look as if it's in a different plumage. And it's just because the feathers have been heavily worn and the edges have disappeared. Here's another example. Um, on this tertial feather from an adult wood sandpiper, notice how the white parts wear away faster than the dark bars here. So when the feather is worn, you actually get this uh, wavy edge to the feather where the white parts have disappeared. And again, we can see that in live birds. So here's a, an adult breeding plumage wood sandpiper in the spring with these nice triangular pale notches on the tertials and on these scapulars here and the coverts here. But if, the, if you look at the same plumage in August, uh, you can see that a lot, a lot of the color, especially the pale dots have disappeared. And if you look at these tertials, you can see actually the, the sort of a uh, crinkle cut, the wavy edge where the white parts have completely worn away on the tertials. And it's actually started to molt. So these scapulas are fresh and you can see the white is here, but not on the covets and on the tertials. Uh, so they're dull and dark because of that. So that's an, the impact of uh, feather wear. Here's another example. These two birds are the same species they are the, in the same plumage, they're both juveniles, and they were both photographed on the same day. This, about a month ago, I photographed these two lesser sandplovers, and the only difference between them is the amount of wear, the feather wear. So these lovely pale edges on the wing coverts and the scapulas, uh, even on the head and the sides of the breast here, have, have completely disappeared on this bird. So the scapulas, um, the edges have worn away, so they are, now they're just plain brown. The head is a lot darker. These uh, breast patches here are also a lot darker. You can still see a little bit of uh, pale feather edges on the coverts, but they've more or less disappeared from the edges of the tertials. And so here's an example where two birds look very different from each other, and yet they're the same species in the same plumage, and the only difference is the amount of wear. And it may be that the bird on the right was hatched uh, a couple of weeks earlier, or it may be that it's encountered uh, more uh, difficult weather conditions than the bird on the left. We, we just don't know. And feather bleaching. So here's an example of a common sandpiper on the left here. It, it's new feathers, the inner primaries here and primary coverts are kind of a dark gray, blackish color. But either side, uh, the primaries on the outside and the secondaries, these are old feathers and they're much paler and browner than the new one. So that's the impact of bleaching. 
And on this wood sandpiper on the right here, it's got a, a fresh set of scapulars and wing coverts, but what remains of the, actually the tertials have almost disappeared. And the primaries here, what, which is what we can see, are very brown and bleached uh, because these are old juvenile feathers. So the older the feathers, the more they are affected by bleaching. All right, so quiz time again. This time, just uh, some text, no pictures. So which part of the feather are where, which parts of the feather wear away fastest? Is it A, the colored parts, B, the pale parts, or C, the black parts? So for question one, write down what you think the answer is, A, B, or C. Okay, thank you. First B. one's coming. First one is B. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we have okay. a good consensus on this one. <laughs> Great. Okay, next question. Same question. Which part of the feather wear away fastest? Is it A, the edges, B, the centers, or C, the covered parts, the parts that are covered by other feathers? So which parts of the feather wear, wear away fastest? That's question two. I think everyone is guessing B for question one. What about question two? Okay, some, some answers some for question answer two coming in there. Some answer yeah. B. All right. Great. Hey, it's good to see Nobuhiro on the call. He's one of my uh, one of my gurus. Wow. From Japan. <laughs> All right. So moving on to the third question, bleaching. I think everyone will get this because it's not just feathers, but bleaching is likely to make feathers appear a darker, b brighter, or c paler. So question three, a, b, or c. The answer is coming in. Yep. Three, uh, C, C, some answer A, yep. B. <laughs> hmm, we've got all of, all of the answers. <laughs> okay, most people are answering C. C. All right, here are the answers. So which parts of the feather wear away fastest? It is the pale parts. So well done. Almost everyone got that one right. The pale parts wear away fastest. Which parts of the feather wear away fastest? The edges, the centers, or the covered parts? It is the edges. So well done okay. if you wrote A. And the last one, bleaching is likely to make feathers appear paler. Okay. Um, so well done if you wrote C, which I think was many of you. Great stuff. All right, now we're going to move on to the third and the probably the most uh, complex part of the talk, and that is molt and plumage. Uh, first of all, let me give you a definition or two. So a plumage is attained by a molt. So the plumage is like the costume that Superman is wearing. The molt is the process of changing old feathers for new ones. So he's molting in that second picture. And then at the front here, he's in his new, uh, I don't know whether it's breeding plumage or non-breeding plumage, but anyway, that's his new plumage. So a plumage is attained by a molt, and shorebirds have two molts per calendar year. In, that means in a 12 month period. Normally these occur between migration and breeding because both migration and breeding take up a lot of their energy. So it makes sense for them to molt in between those times. So many shorebirds molt directly after finishing breeding, before migrating, and sometimes they partly migrate, they, part they molt partway and then they stop and they migrate and then they finish molt when they get to the wintering grounds. 
Uh, others don't molt until they reach the wintering grounds. So uh, on the south of migration, many birds molt after they arrive in their wintering grounds, and then they molt again before they set off in the spring to go north to breed. So that's a general rule that, that shorebirds have two molts a year. Molts can be partial, and by partial, I mean the head, the body, some coverts, maybe a tertial, or they can be complete, which includes the wings and the tail, the flight feathers. So a partial molt would include the, the parts in blue here, and a complete molt would be uh, obviously the whole bird. After the first year of a bird's life, the commonest molt pattern is a complete molt in August to October and a partial molt in February to March. And the way I remember it is to think of all in autumn, some in spring. So in spring, they do a head body molt uh, and a few covets. And in the autumn, they molt everything. So all in autumn, some in spring. Let me give you, uh, I'll try to give you um, an overview of the first three years of a, a shorebird's life, after which it enters into the regular adult uh, molt cycle. So they start off in May or June as a chick covered in a kind of fluffy down. And then they have their first full molt where they grow all their feathers at the same time. So I've represented that by this big box. And after that molt, they're in what we call juvenile plumage. And that may last up until the end of September or October, or even into November. But then they have a partial molt, just the head and the body. And after that, we, we call them that they're in first winter plumage or first non-breeding plumage. Then uh, in their second calendar year, around about the end of February, they start to molt again. Um, and this molt is a very long drawn out molt because in their second calendar year, they're not ready to breed, most of them. So they won't be uh, performing a full migration. They won't be going back to the breeding grounds. And so they tend to, just like teenagers, they like to hang out on the beach, uh, either on their wintering grounds or, or somewhere nearby. And they'll have this very slow, leisurely molt um, of head and body feathers throughout March, April, May, June. And in fact, that molt often just continues straight into the autumn molt, which is a complete molt. And so around about July, these uh, second calendar year birds will start to molt their wing feathers and their tail feathers. And that also is a long molt uh, because they're not migrating great distances. So they can afford to spend more time uh, changing their feathers. After, the, after that second molt is complete, they are indistinguishable from adults um, in non-breeding plumage, even though they may not be sexually mature, they may, some of the bigger species of shorebird may not breed until their fourth year or their fifth year, but from the end of the second year, as they enter into adult non-breeding plumage, it's very hard for us to distinguish them from more mature birds. So we call them adult non-breeding. And then in the spring of their third year, they go through a partial molt again into breeding plumage, adult breeding plumage, and many of the smaller species will, for the first time since they were juveniles, return to the breeding grounds where they may well mate and breed for the first time. After they've finished that, they'll go through a complete molt, which is the first time that they'll have changed their wing feathers since uh, for over a year. So by this time, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. No, they changed their, I beg your pardon. They changed their wing feathers here. So they, they changed their wing feathers once a year around about in, sometime in the autumn. And after that, they go back into adult non-breeding again and then continue in this cycle of some in spring, all in autumn, some in spring, all in autumn, etc. So let's look at these plumages in a bit more detail. I'm gonna choose a species that's quite familiar to most of us, which is a common red shank. So just like every other bird, they start life in an egg. And then uh, when they hatch, they're covered in down, they're able to immediately start foraging and running around. They're not like passerines that uh, are blind and naked. They have, they're able to, they have, they're covered in this down. And then fairly soon they, have this, this for their first full set of feathers, which is juvenile plumage. And that um, will last 
right through until September or later. So juvenile plumage, um, there's several distinctive things about it. First of all, the feathers are smaller than adult feathers. And because of that, they, they seem to fit more neatly and uh, arranged more neatly on the body than adults. So we can see on this bird, they're kind of neat rows of feathers and they all seem to fit very nicely. Um, and so they always look very smart. Also juvenile shorebirds usually have very distinctively patterned juvenile feathers, even on the plainer uh, species like sand plovers, which are very plain on the back, juveniles have quite heavily patterned uh, feathers. But juvenile feathers wear away very fast. One of the trade-offs, because juveniles have to grow their feathers very fast for keeping their body temperature regulated and to be able to migrate. So the trade-off is that because they grow them so fast, they're not particularly robust. They're not as strong as adult feathers. And so we can see that after just a month, this bird, the, the, the wing coverts are very, very ragged and worn looking. If we look at them close up, so here's the, the bird in more or less fresh plumage with these beautiful pale edges to each feather. And then just about a month later, it looks like that. Um, so very quickly, these pale edges wear away. Something else is happening on this bird though. If you look up here, we can see some new feathers. This is a different generation. These are the first uh, non-breeding feathers, scapulars. They're grayer, they're bigger, and uh, they're, they're kind of neat and not, not as worn as these ones. So round about um, end of September, uh, the juveniles begin to, to molt and they have a partial molt a head, body, and some coverts. But for us, the most useful uh, feather track to look at are these scapulars here, the scapulars and the mantle. And so on this bird down here, you can see that this group of feathers is now no longer patterned like these. It's kind of a plain color. And in fact, probably the head and the body feathers have also been molted, but we don't see that as easily because the feathers are so small. And now the bird is in first non-breeding plumage, which it will keep until the following January or February. Let's, let's have a look again at a few birds. So here's a juvenile red shank in late August with these patterned scapulars here. In the, here's another one on the 1st of September. And we can see uh, just one row of scapulars of uh, the non-breeding scapulars coming through here, still quite fresh on the coverts. Here's another bird at the end of September. He, has, he or she has molted probably all the head and body feathers and the scapulars and mantle. And so now we can see quite clearly the contrast between these first non-breeding feathers and the juvenile coverts and tertials, which are very strongly patterned. Here's another bird, uh, early October. Um, not many non-breeding feathers coming through, just a few scapulars here. But we notice that the coverts are now quite worn and the tertials, we can begin to see these little uh, indentations where the pale parts are wearing away. And here's a bird in November, a photograph uh, borrowed from Hawkey. And here we can see not only has the mantle and scapulars been molted, but even a few coverts, these two here and this one here, and this one here. Uh, so the juvenile coverts are still here, but they're becoming more and more worn and there's just a few non-breeding coverts coming through. Now in their first non-breeding plumage they won't change all of them so as we go on through December, January these feathers will just become more and more worn away the, the pale parts. So it becomes quite difficult to age a bird uh, by the time you get to February. So around about February time they start their uh, molt from first non-breeding into first breeding. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a slow molt of head, body, and some coverts into what we call first breeding plumage. Even though we call it first breeding plumage, they won't actually breed in this plumage. Uh, the other thing we can, we can say first summer plumage, but because we live in the tropics, uh, it's probably easier to think of it as first breeding plumage. So in first breeding plumage uh, in their second calendar year, 
uh, it's a, as I mentioned earlier, it's a very slow molt. Often the spring and the autumn molts merge, as I showed you in the diagram. And the new feathers are generally dull. They may be, they may have a little bit of breeding color on them, but they're generally dull. And the, meanwhile, the older juvenile feathers become extremely worn. And so birds in this first breeding plumage usually just look very untidy and not, not particularly nice to look at. Here's a good example. Uh, first breeding plumage red shank taken in April. It just kind of looks untidy and scruffy and dull. Often birds which stay late in Malaysia. So this was taken on the 7th of May. These birds are first breeding plumage, a common red shank and a gray tailed tattler. Um, they may start to develop a little bit of breeding colors like the barring on this tattler here, but that, that's all. It won't, it won't develop full breeding plumage. And they will just uh, probably hang around in the, in the region um, the whole summer until the following migratory season. Here's an interesting picture. This was taken in late August when we're already starting to see the return of uh, both adults and juveniles. So here we have on the left, a juvenile that's been hatched just this year, just a couple of months previous to this photograph with the richly patterned coverts and the very neat uh, flight feathers. And on the right here, we have an adult in breeding plumage, which is still in breeding plumage and has fairly nice, uh, not very worn flight feathers. And in the middle here, we have these two second calendar year birds molting from first breeding into first into adult non-breeding. And what we see here is the inner primaries are uh, nice and new, but then these very old bleached outer primaries, which are old juvenile feathers from, they're more than a year old. So we can see that a very great contrast between these very old juvenile feathers and the new fresh adult non-breeding feathers. And so we can tell these by their extremely worn, unmolted flight feathers. Um, they may start molting earlier than adults because they don't have to breed. They don't have to wait till they finish breeding. Um, and, but they often don't complete their molt until after the adults have finished. So adults will have a fast molt because they need to um, get a molt in before they migrate or after they arrive. Whereas the second count year birds take it a much slower rate. So here's an example of a bird in first breeding plumage taken in September this year. You can see how these are unmolted juvenile flight feathers, extremely ragged. And remember what I said about white feathers being weaker because they have no pigment. So these are extremely tattered. And even the, the primaries, uh, they're very bleached. They're worn away. And so all we can see are, the, are these spikes of the uh, feather shaft along the trailing edge here. So characterized by these extremely worn and bleached unmolted juvenile flight feathers. Here's another one taken in early October. And here we see the unmolted juvenile secondaries have almost disappeared completely. All we have left is pretty much the feather shaft and a few wisps of feather. And similarly with the primaries, you can see the the shaft is still there, but much of the end of the feather has worn away. It's amazing this bird can still fly. But what we also see is it started to molt into adult non-breeding plumage. And so this starts with the inner primaries and then the inner secondaries. And so we see the contrast between these beautiful, fresh adult non-breeding feathers and the extremely worn uh, juvenile flight feathers, which are over a year old. So from about October time, uh, these birds will finally have uh, their, their complete molt where they'll re replace all their feathers. But again, because it's quite a long drawn out process, uh, the feathers are not all replaced at the same time. So some will be a little older and more worn than others. So you won't get a situation where, just like a juvenile, where all the feathers are exactly the same age. And so after that, they molt into adult non-breeding plumage, and that plumage lasts through until February or so in their third year. So adult feathers are larger than juvenile feathers, 
and because of that, they don't seem to fit quite so well on the body. They're a bit more all over the place. Um, they're also different ages, as I mentioned earlier, some grown earlier than others. So they're not so neatly arranged and they're not so well patterned. Uh, you can see that they're mostly kind of dull, mud colored. And that's generally true for shorebirds in adult non-breeding plumage. Um, but you can see that they have replaced all their flight feathers. So this picture taken on the 7th of December, they have, they don't have the patterned coverts of juveniles. So we know that these are not juveniles, but they have replaced all their flight feathers because they've just finished their complete molt into adult non-breeding plumage. So they're in fresh condition. Okay, so we've now reached the third calendar year and round about January uh, or February, they'll start to molt again. And this time it's a partial molt. It's a rapid molt because now they have a time, a pressing deadline. They have to start migrating in order to arrive on the breeding grounds in time to be able to breed. And so this is a much more rapid molt, starts and finishes much earlier and results in a much uh, more richly patterned plumage. So here are some examples of common red shanks in uh, April. And you can see that the breeding feathers are quite intricately patterned. And in many shorebirds, they take on colors that are similar to the colors of their Arctic breeding grounds. So quite a lot of chestnuts, oranges, russet. Um, also in, this, in the case of this species, notice how their bare parts, their legs and their bill start to really color up. I didn't affect, I didn't change the saturation on this photograph. They really are that bright in spring. Not every species that winters or migrates through Malaysia finishes their molt while they're still here. So unfortunately, we we never see rough in their full breeding plumage because they, they finish their molt much closer to the breeding grounds. Similarly, we've never seen Norman's green shank in full breeding plumage in Malaysia. Um, they, they're, or rather, we see them in fresh breeding plumage, but we don't see them in their full breeding colors. Many breeding colors, like Norman's green shank, are attained through a process of wear. And so the fresh feathers have lots of pale edges, like this curlew sandpiper. And as the pale edges wear away, the colors start to become more intense. So in fresh breeding plumage in March, they may look like this. And in April, and maybe by May, they're looking like this, and they're ready to breed. And that's just simply because the pale uh, edges to the, to the feathers have worn away, and it reveals the, uh, the more intensely colored centers of the feathers. Um, they continue this process right the way through the breeding uh, season, and even when they come back to us in August, by which time they're looking very bleached and extremely worn. So here's some real birds. Here's a, one in beginning of April with these broad pale edges to the underpart feathers. And then just a few days later, but much more worn and much more bright. And then this one even brighter. And in August, here's a bird that has, is still in breeding plumage, but you can see the wing and the scapulars and these underparts uh, are very, very ragged and, and, and bleached. And then they go through another complete molt. And again, once they're adults, this happens quite rapidly. And they assume adult non-breeding plumage again, which is the second time they'll have had that plumage, uh, which generally looks very dull above. So I'm just gonna give you a short summary because I know that's like fire hose treatment and probably you lost, uh, lost track. So. Um, this is a, a quick plumage summary for you. So in July to October, we can look out for juveniles and juveniles can be told by the same aged, neat and quite strongly patterned upper part feathers. Then in non-breeding plumage from October to say February, um, some more adult like scapulars and mantle coming through, still got some old juvenile tertials, uh, sorry, scapulars here and all the wing is still in juvenile plumage. So 
you notice the pattern of these tertials here is the same as the pattern of these here. So this is a first non-breeding redneck stint. So a con contrast between the fresh non-breeding scapulas and the old juvenile wings. In March to October, when they molt into first breeding plumage, they'll develop a few uh, breeding pattern scapulas, uh, maybe some pink feathers on the throat here, uh, but generally they'll look a bit like uh, adult winter. Um, but you'll see a big difference between the fresh uh, body feathers, the scapulas here, and the very worn uh, tertials and, and coverts. And so as we move on through the year, they become, these feathers become more and more bleached. And so we, when we see a bird with a big contrast between fresh mantle and scapulas and very worn tertials, we can guess that that's probably a second calendar year bird. And then when they finish their molt, their complete molt in their second calendar year autumn, they are in adult non-breeding plumage, which is very plain generally. And the wing and the body feathers are more or less the same age. And then moving into the, the spring, the pre-breeding molt, uh, when they first molt, they're in this lovely, frosty, fresh um, plumage with lots of white on it uh, and broad, pale fringes. And then as they, as they, as those pale edges wear away, the colors become more intense and they're ready for display when they reach to the breeding grounds. So this is a fresh adult breeding and this is a worn adult breeding in April, May. Okay. We've reached the end, but before we finish, it's time for one more quiz. So I'm going to give you, the clue is in the date, all right? So if you look on this chart, uh, we're talking about somewhere in this period of time. Um, the dates are approximate because the, the birds obviously don't follow our calendar. So they may molt in March, they may molt in February, but it's around this area. So I'm not going to give you a choice this time, I'm going to ask you, what plumage do you think this bird is in? OK, Dave, hmm. while, waiting the, uh, while waiting the others to answer, um, would you like to answer my, my, my question? I just want to know, is there any specific functions of uh, feathers group uh, for each of the feathers group, function, oh, yeah. their function. Can yes. you tell us before well, we're waiting for the others to answer? Sure. Um, well, obviously the most important feathers on the bird are the flight feathers. That The um, primaries and secondaries are what enable them to complete these amazing migrations every, every year. And mm -hmm. so those are the most important feathers. And because of that, the other feathers primarily function to, to protect them so as we can see on this photograph, of all the flight feathers, all we can see is the tip of the primaries here. All the others are hidden underneath these coverts. So, mm -hmm. and, then, and then the coverts themselves are covered by the scapulars. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're, they're kind of arranged in layers to provide maximum protection for the flight feathers. Um, the other thing that, that feathers, the important thing that feathers do is they enable birds to thermoregulate. So they're going to be in very uh, varied weather conditions. They'll be in mm -hmm. sub-zero temperatures in, uh, in, early, in early summer up in the Arctic Circle. And they'll be in extremely hot temperatures here in, on the, in the tropics. And so their feathers mm -hmm. enable them to either retain heat if they hold them close or release heat if they fluff them out. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's those. are. And then the third, the third purpose of feathers is they use them for camouflage and for display. So um, in the during the winter time, they want to blend in with the mud flats. That's why they're so dull. Mm -hmm. But in the in the breeding season, they they color up and they begin to use that as part of their display. Okay. Okay. So we, Thank you, okay we have a number of answers, um, and uh, I see adult non-breeding and I see adult breeding. Okay. Well, well done. <laughs> if you said adult breeding. Yep, this is a male Kentish plover, and uh, it's molted into adult breeding plumage, and we can tell that by the richness of the crown and the blackness of these uh, 
facial markings and here. So well done if you got, actually, if you got adult, well done. Um, it is actually a breeding, but a breeding plumage bird. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, number two. What about this one? So this is taken in middle of, middle of August. So which means it could be one of these three options. It could be juvenile, it could be first breeding, or it could be adult breeding. So which do you think this one is? It looks very fresh, Eddie. Very fresh um, plumage, is it? It does. <laughs> okay, so that do, one is the hint. Huh? What do people think? <laughs> so, question two. Juvenal, Yinli say juvenal, 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 juvi. Okay. Adult breeding. <laughs> yeah. Well, it certainly looks bright, doesn't it? Bright and and attractive, mm -hmm. but it is a bit late for adult breeding. Uh, end because of August. August, August. Yeah. Of August, yeah. August. So, in fact, it is. Oh, someone's even got the right species. Yeah, it is a fresh juvenile curlew sandpiper. So this is when they come back, when they come back to us or when they come to us in, in early, uh, early autumn, they come with this beautiful, neat, uh, same age feathers. And so that, that's juvenile plumage and fresh juvenile plumage. Okay, number three, what about this one? So this is taken at the end of September, somewhere around here. So is it, well, is it, one of which one of these three do you think it is? Please take note the date, the date, yeah, on the September. Yep, end of September. And look and look carefully on the cover. On the cover, is it is it the cover part? <laughs> well, you actually, there's two things you can look at, and that is the difference between scapula. the scapulas and the covets. Yeah, there's a big contrast mm -hmm. between the, the age of them. These are very new, and these are very old. And the, and the tertials too, extremely old. So number three, we have a few different answers. Mm -hmm. Good, 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 good. The dot num breeding, first yeah. breeding, second year, first okay. year non breeding. All right, let me give you the answer. It is, well, actually molting from first breeding into adult non-breeding. So these new feathers are adult non-breeding feathers. And these old feathers are really old juvenile feathers, which makes it mm. uh, around about here. So the wing feathers are still juvenile. The body feathers uh, were molted in the spring. So you can see some weak breeding colors, a bit of brown here. And actually there are probably possibly even three, three the results of three plumages here, uh, juvenile mm -hmm. wing feathers, and then a bit of first breeding here, and then some adult non-breeding here. All right, well done if you got that one. Number four, we got two more. What about this one? It was taken at the end of October. So we're talking about somewhere around here. It's a common red shank again. Number four, what do you think? Someone says second year. Have a look carefully. You can see a clue in the scapulas if you look really carefully. Mm. Answers are slowing down. I think people are taking a careful look. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, a few answers coming in. Wow, someone's got third year non-breeding. Yeah, wow, third year non-breeding. <laughs> Which we would call the year adult. and the, the, the plumage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I can, actually, I haven't seen a correct answer yet. Mm. Hi, I think... No, I haven't seen a correct answer yet. Mm. So look carefully. Nope, still no correct answer. Is it juvenile? It is. It is a juvenile. <laughs> but it's Yay! very warm. I'm juvenile. correct. 
So if you look at these wing covers, uh, you'll see that they very neat. they are very neat, yeah, but they're mostly yeah. quite worn. And then just here, you have just a very few of these adult non of these first non-breeding scapulars coming through, just about three or four feathers here. So okay, Emmy, well done. You got it right. Amar, well done. You got it right. Good job. Okay, last one. All right, this was taken in the middle of December. So December. somewhere here. Actually, there's really only two choices because by this time, even a second year bird will look just the same as an adult. So it's either gonna be first non-breeding or adult non-breeding. Which one do you think? The date is very, very important yeah, Dave. The date is very the date important. Is very, yes, I mean, sometimes, sometimes, yeah. yeah. Sometimes people send me photographs of birds and I have to say, which date? Because unless you tell me the date, <laughs> I really can't tell you what it is. Okay, so we've got a few. Well, first answer is year one juvenile. First yeah. year. First on breeding. It looks very fresh. Plumage, it does. Yeah? Very fresh, yeah. Very fresh. Okay, Michelle says adult non breeding. Victor says it's my birthday. <laughs> so <we've> got, <laughs> Victor has a birthday on the 15th of December. Okay. First non breeding. Any more? Amar, adult non breeding. Okay. Mm -hmm. These are two. All right. A few adult non breeding coming in, which is good because that's what it is. It's an adult non breeding. Yes, adult non -breeding. Um, the way we can tell it's not a first non breeding is that the, the color, the pattern of the coverts is, are not the juvenile. See, if this was a first non breeding, this wing would still have juvenile pattern. Uh, covers mm -hmm. and it actually has adult patent covers which you may not know unless you have a field guide so so this is what uh, uh, an adult non-breeding looks like when it's completed its molt so again well done for having a go and if you didn't get them all right uh, don't worry I, I would be amazed if you did get them all right unless you already knew this stuff because there's a lot of information here but hopefully you can look back over this um, use it as a reference and uh, hopefully you'll have learned something. So I, I wanted to try and find a few resources for you. Uh, there's not that many, to be honest, um, or at least if there are, they're difficult to find. So here's an article I wrote on my blog many years ago, which covers kind of the same, what we've covered tonight. So that might be useful to read. Um, one, of the, one of the blogs that has been so much help to me is from uh, Nobu, who's, on the, who's actually on this, uh, on this webinar now. So Nobuhiro Hashimoto is, uh, lives in Japan and he has an amazing website with every species that you could wish for to see in Malaysia and a few more. And uh, even though the text is in Japanese, uh, the age of the bird is in English. And so I found this extremely helpful uh, as a reference to, to look at his uh, photographs of juveniles and adult non-breeding and first breeding and all, all the plumages are there. So that's a fantastic resource. Um, in terms of books, I had a look around. Unfortunately, none of the uh, regional field guides that I know of have enough detail uh, when it comes to aging and plumage of shorebirds. The best one that I could find is actually this one, the Australian Bird Guide, which came out a couple of years ago. And as you can see, um, Curly Sandpiper, for example, has six different um, images that show juvenile, worn juvenile. Uh, I think that's first year non-breeding, I'm not sure. Um, and then fresh breeding plumage and then worn breeding plumage. So this book is excellent, although it does cover a lot of birds which don't occur in Malaysia, obviously. But if you're looking for a resource to uh, learn how to age shorebirds, then I would recommend this one. All right. Well, that's it. So over to you, Munira. Um, are there any questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Dave. So this is the time uh, uh, question Q and A session. Okay. If you do have any uh, question, yeah, regarding to this topic, you can uh, type um, on the on the comments. Yeah. So we can pass to Dave. So we have one first question. Uh, the first question, Dave, but, uh, from Zaim Hazib. What are the lifespans uh, of most of the shorebirds? Yeah, thanks very much, Zaim. Um, well, uh, 
actually, surprisingly, if if they can survive to adulthood, I mean, that's the biggest mortality is during the first 12 to 24 months of their lives. And uh, in, um, that that is quite high. But once if they if they reach adulthood, then even the smallest waders like the stints can live 20 years or, uh, for 20 years. And some of the bigger ones, maybe 30 or even 40 years. So they're extremely long lived. Oh, OK. That's good to know that. OK, Linda uh, said, what was the oh, website? Can you show the web website okay. again? Yep. There it is. Oh, and again, so this will be available. The, the website. So if you just type in Dig Deep 1962 or wait this month by month, you should be able to find that. Dave, one good question here. How did you get to know so much? <laughs> <laughs> this is the same uh, 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 question that I want to know. Mm. Yeah. Can you answer? My wife was asking me that this afternoon. She said, how do you know all this stuff? And I'm like, I don't, Very detailed, I, Dave. I think it's a combination. It's a combination of many, many years of experience of watching, mm -hmm. um, reading some really good resources like Nobu's uh, website. Uh, basically, it comes from asking questions. When you look at a bird and you think, "What is? You know, why does it look like that?" And so, asking mm -hmm. questions and then being part of a, a community where you can ask questions and others can help you. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's very important, being part of a, whether it's an online community or a physical community. Um, yeah, having access to some good books, um, that helps. Mm -hmm. But just spending hours and hours and hours in the field and just trying to puzzle. And I think actually taking photographs really helps because you come home, you look at the pictures and you can see the detail that maybe you didn't notice in the field. So that's one yes. way I've kind of grown in my understanding. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, next question, Dave, uh, uh, from Jens. Uh, is it possible to age adult birds, uh, meaning to see if a bird is 5, 10, or 15 years old? Is it possible? It is possible if they have a leg flag uh, with a, you know, if so if the bird was trapped and, and uh, attached, they had a leg flag with an alphanumeric code on it, and if it was trapped as a juvenile, then you can know exactly how old, well, you can know to the nearest year how old it is. But if just by looking at plumage, I do not uh, believe that there is a way of determining how old they are. No, mm -hmm. unfortunately not. No. Once they okay. get to adulthood, that, that's they look very similar from year to year. Okay. Okay. Uh, from Mohammed Sri, how many kilometers does the shorebird fly in one day? Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so we're moving beyond uh, molt and plumage, but um, again, what we know from uh, studies of birds that have been tagged, um, there's a, a, been an ongoing study in New Zealand where they fitted satellite, uh, satellite transmitters to the backs of uh, a large shorebird, the Bartel Godwit, and they have, have been amazed by what they found, and that is that these birds, uh, particularly on their southward migration, they can fly, well, the, the world record is something like 12,200 kilometers yes, uh, yeah. without landing. And that, that was over a period of, I think, eight or nine days and nights. So mm -hmm. that's not, not feeding, not drinking, uh, not landing, not sleeping, just flying solidly for seven or eight days, covering 12,200 kilometers. So if you do the math, you divide 12,200 by eight, and you'll get roughly how, how far they can fly in one day. Yes. But it's a long way. Yeah. Yes, that's so amazing. Dear. Okay. Uh, we have a friend from um, Philippines, uh, Chita Chua, um, just uh, wrote a comment there. If you guys are interested, join our Philippine Birding FP group. Uh, that's the link. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chita Chua. And Michael MK, do you, do you yeah. feel bored to look at them daily? <laughs> Uh, well, I may be very weird, Michelle, but I honestly, I never feel bored looking at shorebirds. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you are uh, seafood, eh? Okay. So from Ryan Wee, what is the best way to find and study shorebirds? Okay. Well, uh, Brian, I don't know. Um, I don't know where you are. I know. I think you're in Slang or somewhere. Ryan, yeah, yeah. From, top, yeah. from Slang, so, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, what I like to do is to 
find a good a spot and get really familiar with it. So uh, you can do that by uh, often by asking other birders, birders or uh, if, if not, then looking at a map and uh, looking at where there's an estuary with a lot of uh, tidal mudflats or mm -hmm. uh, rice paddies or, um, you know, coastal wetlands. And then uh, the best, I find that usually in most places, the best time to go is on a rising tide or a falling tide or a high tide excuse me, or a high tide, because at low tide, the birds are normally very far away and very spread out. Mm -hmm. At high tide, if you can find their roost, then you've got about two or three hours where you could just sit and watch them and they're all together and they're rel they can be relatively close. So my recommendation would be uh, try to find one spot. It doesn't even need to have a lot of birds. I mean, the place where I watch here in Sarawak, uh, we probably have less than a thousand waders and sometimes it's only a maybe even less than 100. But even if you have, uh, you know, 20 or 30 birds, then you can watch them. And, um, you know, I find that that is very rewarding. So you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be near a site with hundreds of thousands of birds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Uh, next question from Noor Ain. How to differentiate female and male shorebirds? By color, maybe? Okay. okay. There are, oh, okay. there are, yeah, some species are what we call sexually dimorphic. In other words, they have different plumages. So um, in the case of the Kentish plover I showed you earlier, the male uh, in breeding plumage looks uh, has different colors. And the best thing I think would be for you to get a good field guide, which will have mm -hmm. that information. In general, uh, females of most species are larger and have longer bills. Uh, and in breeding plumage, the males are brighter in color generally. Not always. There are uh -huh. some that's reversed. Okay. That's the, the, the general rules, yeah? Yeah. Okay, Dave. This is a one uh, uh, like a personal question. What species of shorebirds you love most and why? Uh, <laughs> All right. The, There's no specific, I think. <laughs> the one I'm looking at right now. I mean, the one I'm looking at is usually my favorite. No, I mean, I, I guess I find them so interesting. I don't, I don't really... I mean, they're... Generally speaking, when I go and look, looking for shorebirds, I'm always looking for the one that's a bit unusual or not so commonly seen. And so if I find a bird that I haven't seen before or I've only seen a few times before, obviously I'll be very happy to see that one. But it wouldn't be a specific species necessarily. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Dave, I have my own question. Can you, oh, yeah. can you answer it? <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Uh, Dave, if um, how how we can differentiate um, the adult non-breeding between uh, two calendar year and third calendar year? How we can differentiate? I don't, the, yeah. I don't think you can. Well, okay, you. The only way you can do it is if the uh, the second calendar year in non. So you're talking about after the complete molt, right? You're saying mm -hmm. second calendar year after the complete molt. Mm -hmm. If it if it has truly if it, has, if it has truly molted all its feathers, you can't tell the difference. Mm. However, you may find that some juvenile feathers have been retained. And especially on the, uh, the, the, for, the leading edge of the wing. So that's mm -hmm. the area that's the most protected from the elements because it's under the scapulars. And so sometimes if the bird stretches its wing, mm -hmm. uh, you'll see one or two juvenile, uh, retained juvenile covers. So if you see those, then you can say, okay, this is a, yes, this second. Is a second non breeding, second, second non breeding yes, plume. Yes. Um, okay. So taking photographs of birds when they're wing, wing stretching or really good quality of photographs of birds in flight showing the upper wing, that can be a way of telling them, but it's very difficult. And, you know, uh, two things about this talk. One is, I rec if you say you're lost, I understand totally because it is a lot to take in. But secondly, mm -hmm. There are many times when I can't tell, you know, I just have to say, I think it's a whatever. Um, it's only <laughs> when you get really close, good views that you can say, okay, that's a, a second calendar year, you know, a spring, a breeding, breeding, a sec, what do you call it? Like first breeding or, or first non-breeding. If the birds are a great distance away, then it's probably going to be difficult for you to say much more than adult juvenile. And that, and you may have to just leave it 
at that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there any other question from, from the viewers? I got one question that's come twice here. It says, what waiter have you seen that is a super surprise for you and Mary? And, okay. and then ah, yeah, Sri from Irene and Muhammad Sri. Yeah, yeah. And I have to say, I haven't seen one that's been a super surprise yet. I'm still waiting. <laughs> um, so uh, a few people last, uh, the year before I arrived in Miri, saw a long bill dowager in the place where I go every week. Uh, and I haven't seen one yet. I'm waiting for that. But um, so far, I, I don't think I've seen something that was just like totally unexpected. Actually, Miri is rather poor in general for migratory birds because it's kind of in the middle of the North Borneo coast. And there's a lot of sea between us and, and Southeast Asia. So not that many birds come here compared to where you are, Munira, where mm -hmm. you, you have yeah. tens of thousands and we have hundreds. So <laughs> I hope to see uh, Spoonie one day, Spoonbill. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. hopefully. So, answer. okay, I, I will attend one last, maybe one last question, Dave because we are now uh, at the end of the session, 9.35. Sure. So from Brian, we do, do the um, food they consume influence the color of their feathers? Mm, mm. Interesting question that. I mean, that's definitely true with some species, for example, flamingos and some gulls and terns, uh, particularly if they eat a lot of um, uh, shellfish and often it, it produce, produces kind of a pink, a pinkish uh, coloration. Uh, for waders, uh, for shorebirds, I don't think that's so much the case. Most of the color is produced by the hormonal levels in the in the bird rather than the diet. Um, <laughs> I suppose uh, if if for example, if if some shorebirds were kept in captivity and they were not fed. Uh, a diet which was close to their natural diet, they may end up with some different coloration, but I don't know. It's possible. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe the, the other question. Any tips? How can we get close to them for photos? Uh -huh. This is from Justin. Uh -huh. Maybe yeah. uh, he is not very familiar. Well, uh, you know, Justin, it really depends on the conditions uh, you're in. Um, when I've been birding in West Malaysia, where there's very extensive mud flats and where the mud is very deep it's very difficult to get close to the birds you really have to try to uh figure out where they go during high tide so there's the best chance of getting close to birds is when the tide pushes them up uh, close to you mm -hmm. uh, and i would say it's quite risky as well if you if you try to go out on mud flats you should never go alone you should always have a copy of the tide tables with you and be aware of where the tide, whether the tide's coming in, going out, et cetera. Um, but yeah, it's generally difficult when you, so mud, mud flats are where the most birds are, but it's also the least accessible for human beings. Um, I've tried all kinds of things. I've tried with Munira and uh, Nasir scooting out on, <laughs> on, on hands and knees, getting really stuck with a, a polystyrene uh, box in front of us without with our equipment in it and you sort of push it along you need to be fit and strong to do that or very lightweight um or you could try approaching by boat but then of course you've got the wave action up and down all the time uh where i am at the moment i'm very fortunate in that we have a much harder substrate is sandy beaches so i can pretty much i can drive up to the birds um mm. yeah, so that but then there are not so many birds so a lot of it depends on the conditions where you are and trying to find a way of figuring out how are you going to get close to them. And it, it's about looking at tide and figuring out where birds go at certain times of the tide and just um, and then arranging your schedule to go at those times. But normally you need a pretty big lens, I think. Yeah. OK, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, that was the last question, I think, Dave. Thank you very All much right. for. Yeah, OK. Eh? Thank you very much for answering uh, everyone's question tonight. And we at Shawbirds Peninsula Malaysia Project would like to thank you so much with today's input, Dave, uh, with your vast knowledge on shorebirds. Yeah. And we are very, very happy that we learned so much about shorebirds, especially on the plumage and moth in just less than two hours. Huh? <laughs> so much, 
so much information, you know. So you you just like walking encyclopedia of show, but that's why I always call you Sifu. <laughs> okay, so I think well, everyone, you much, everyone, yeah. you call you Sifu. Okay, so much. I hope I hope this is also a call to everyone out there who love to do show birds watching. This is the time to train your eyes and start to describe your show birds in details. Not only looking at the species, but now you can even know more what, what are the stages of the show birds that you are looking at, okay? So uh, I thank you for coming in and joining us. You are all, we have guests all around the world, like the show birds, yeah, international. So we would like to thank you, Dave. Thank you so much for your time and sharing. Okay, before we end, I, I want to bring um, our technical team, uh, Dr. Nuru, Dr. Aini, coming in to take a, uh, a group photo. Okay. Aini, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nuru. Coming, coming, coming. Okay. So thank you very much, yeah. Uh, my my uh, the, the the team behind behind the scene. Okay, one, one, two, three. Okay. Okay, safe. All right. Okay, thank you everyone. Okay, hope to uh see you in the next webinar, hopefully. Okay, thank you. All bye bye. Right. Okay. Happy way, happy showbird watching everyone. Bye bye. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you.